This is the second of a two-part series on initializers. In the first video, we concentrated on designated initializers, member-wise initializers for structs, and multiple designated initializers. If you haven't seen this video, I suggest you start there. I'll leave a link in the notes below. In this video, we'll extend what we learned and look at subclassing and inheritance, as well as convenience, override, required, and failable initializers. If this is something you want to learn, then keep watching. Feel free to follow along with me. I've included a link to this playground in the notes below. Let's start with subclassing and how we deal with initializers in that situation. Consider this class. I've already created an initializer for each of the properties because, as we learned in the first video, each of the properties are in an undetermined state. None are optional, and none have default values. Let's start at line 24 and create a subclass of person called child. It has one property called parents that is an array of person. So how do we initialize this? Well, we not only have to initialize parents because it is undetermined, but also the three properties of the superclass. In the body of the initializer, we initialize the parents property as we always have, self.parents equals parents. And following this, we can call the superclass init by passing in all of the parameters and matching them with the superclass parameters. If we reverse the order, we get an error because all subclass properties must be initialized prior to calling the super.init. So let's create a couple of instances of parents, one for Stuart and one for Emily. And now let's create a child that has these two parents. That's it. Notice our technique of tapping the show results button after running our playground displays the results in line. Well, this is not as useful for subclasses though, as you don't get the detail of our two parents, but at least we see it's not an empty array. If we want to create a second initializer for our child, where we default parents to an empty array, we only need to initialize the superclass properties. However, this time we get an error. Overriding declaration requires an override keyword. And this is because it has the same signature as one of the initializers in our superclass. Let's let Xcode fix that error for us, and you see the override keyword is inserted before the init, and the error goes away. Now, when I create a new child instance, there are two options to choose from. Choosing the first one, we see that we create a child, with an empty array of parents. Let's say that we want to slightly modify the child class to make a person array property optional. So let's create a new subclass of person called child2. And this time I'm going to make the parents an optional array of person. We don't have to provide an initializer for parents this time because it's optional. And I don't need to call the superclass init function either because if your subclass doesn't define any designated initializers, it automatically inherits all of the superclass designated initializers. Let's create a child2 instance and see that we only get a single option to choose from, and that's the superclass initializer. The parent array will default to nil. If we want to add parents, we have to do that after the fact, and we'll need to first set the value of parents to either an empty array with one or more parents. And once at least one is added, we can append to it. We still get the cryptic display of our instance when we show results, but we can drill down and show the results of the parents to see the detail. Let's now take a look at convenience initializers. Here is a repeat of this person class from the previous playground. I get to create a person instance using the single initializer. We also learned that we can have multiple initializers. 
So if we wanted to create a second initializer that would default the nationality to Canadian, for example, then we can add it in like this. This gives us a second, simpler option. Well, what if you wanted to keep all additional initializers in an extension of our class? So let's create an extension for person. First, let's copy it from the class itself and comment it out. Of course, we need to comment out our instance as well because we don't have the initializer anymore. And paste it into the extension. After pasting it into the extension, we get this error. Designated initializer cannot be declared in an extension of person. Did you mean this to be a convenience initializer? And it offers us the ability to fix it using the convenience keyword. Well, now we get a bunch of new errors. Well, this is because these are secondary supporting initializers for a class, and they must call a designated initializer in the same class. And since we only have one, we need to use this one and pass in our name and age parameters, but set the default to Canadian. Creating a new instance now shows us the two initializer options, and I can choose the shorter Canadian one. Let's go back to our previous playground and copy the entire child class. Returning here, I'll paste it into line 39. We can create a new child, and we see we get three different options. And this appears to be confusing because one of the initializers is a person method, and two are child methods. The first one, person, gives us the convenience initializer from the person class that will default the nationality to Canadian and use the override init to set the parents array to an empty array. The second is the second override initializer that will default parents to an empty array but allow me to pick a nationality. And the third is the full meal deal. I just want to show you what would have happened had I not used an extension and a convenience initializer. Let's comment out the extension and uncomment the second init in our person class. You see that there are no issues creating our instance of person. However, our first child instance gives this error, missing argument for parameter nationality in call. You see, without the extension on the convenience initializer, I do not have access to that second designated initializer in our class. So let's revert back and remove all errors. Moving on. The required keyword in Swift can be used in front of initializers. And its usage is simple, and it's a small use case, but the usage of the keyword can easily be understood in the wrong way. Let's consider this person class with a single name property and initializer. We can subclass this class to create a class called parent that has an array of string assigned to the variable children. As we learned, to initialize, we first need to initialize the children before calling the super init for name. This presents us with a single initializer option when creating a parent. Now, if we want to create a second initializer for parent that asks for the name, but always assigns an empty array to parents, we get this error. Overriding declaration requires an override keyword. So as we saw previously, since the init's parameters are the same as the one in the superclass person, we need to use that override keyword. Now there are two options for creating a parent. We could continue to create several classes that will be subclasses of our person. 
And if you recall, the second initializer that only asked for the name parameter was optional. When I added it, I had to use the override keyword in our subclass. Well, let's create a third class that also subclasses person and name it child. And this time has a single optional string property called pet. Now, because pet is optional, child requires no initializers and we get a single inherited initializer from the person class. Well, keep this in mind because I'll come back to it. Let's create a second initializer that allows me to enter the name and a pet. Again, as we learned, we initialize pet first and call the super init passing in the name parameter. The first instance is no longer valid because I only have a single initializer now and I no longer inherit from the super class. So let's comment it out and see if we can fix that and create a new one with a pet. Now I, as owner of this code, want to make sure that anyone who subclasses person is forced to create an initializer that will only have the name parameter from the super class and then have it default to nil values or assign defaults to all of the properties. The parent class already has that, but it's marked as override. Notice I said forced. We want that init to be required and not leave it up to the developer to remember to create an override initializer as we did for the parent class. The solution is to go back to person and make the initializer required. This creates an error in our parent class though. It says use required modifier to override a required initializer. So we can change it to required instead of override and that removes the error. However, if I scroll down to the child class now, we see that our class here is no longer valid. It says required initializer init name must be provided by the subclass of person. I can choose to fix this and when I do it inserts an initializer with the same parameters and the error goes away but with a fatal error message. This just means that our app will crash if we try to use this initializer and that's not good. So we can create one just as I did for the parent. I can specify pet to nil and call the super init, passing the name parameter onto it. I can now uncomment our first child instance and I no longer get an error since our required initializer is now satisfied. A failable initializer is an initializer that might work or it might not. You can write these in your own structs and classes by using init question mark rather than init and return nil if something goes wrong. The return value will then be an optional of your type for you to unwrap however you want. For example, let's copy this class and paste it into line 22. Now what I want to do is only accept the creation of an instance of person if the name is not an empty string. If it's empty, we want to return nil. Otherwise, go ahead and create the instance. This means we can use a failable initializer by placing a question mark after an it and do an if else check on our name. I like to use the trimming characters struct function to ensure that we don't allow any strings with one or more spaces or with leading and trailing spaces. So if name trimming characters with white spaces and new lines is not equal to an empty string, we're okay and we can assign this same check to our name property. If it's empty, we return nil. So let's try this. I can create a person with a name with spaces before and after, and a second that is a string with just a bunch of spaces. P1 is valid, and I have the benefit of trimming the white space. Yet, P2 returns nil. Now, you can stop watching this video if you like, but I like to cycle back to videos that I've already created 
and see how I can use what I've learned. I'm going to create a create person function that has a completion handler and that completion handler has a result type as a argument. Now, if you don't know about the result type that was introduced in Swift 5 and how to write completion handlers, I suggest that you watch those two of my videos and I'll leave links to those in the notes below. A result type works best if you define an enum that describes the possible error. Ours is simple and we have only a single case invalid name. Now I want to create that function that will accept the name and then if the name is valid use a completion handler to deal with the result so I can carry on and present some kind of error notification in my UI. This closure in my completion handler will have a single parameter and this will be a result type that will either be the person created or if nil an error of our new creation error type. Within the body, we can create a person and then guard check to see if it isn't nil. If it is, our completion function argument becomes dot failure, invalid name, and then returns. If it isn't nil, our completion function argument is a success with the person created, and we can safely unwrap it because it's guaranteed to be a success. We'll call the createPerson function passing in a valid name, and our completion function closure provides us with a result that we can switch on. If failure, we can print out our error, and if success, we can print out that person was created and carry on. There we have it, a successful creation of a person. If we pass in an invalid name, we get a recognizable error. Again, if you haven't watched the first video in this two-part series, I'll leave the link in the notes below. I have lots of other videos available and in the queue as well, so please check out the rest of my channel. You can also visit my website to see the apps that I have available on the App Store and visit my GitHub page to see what I have available as public repositories. If you like what you've seen, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And ring the bell to get notified when I post new videos. I'm most active on Twitter, so please follow me there as well to find out what else I'm up to. Thanks for watching.